Muchas gracias, Susan. Por Thank eso. you so much, Susan, for your help with translation or interpretation for this webinar that we where we want to explain a concrete proposal that we're doing from different organizations, different platform, national and international organizations. And we're going to talk about why we're demanding the participation in the reviewing of treaties that allow multimillionaire demands against Colombia. We welcome all the people that are connecting here in these moments from Colombia and from other countries and in the world who are here in this webinar that is being organized from by La Guajira Le Habla al País, Comité para la Defensa del Agua al Paramo, and the international mission that happened a few months ago in Colombia with the campaign Stop the Transnational Demands, the School of Rights and Political Science in Santander, the Group of Investigations of Collective Rights and Environmental Rights, HIPCA from the University, National University of Colombia. And we are going to have some guests, very special guests for this conversation with lots of knowledge about this subject. And next to our brothers in the Guajira and alongside national and international organizations, we are presenting a proposal that's very concrete. We're presenting it to the national government to stop this abuse of the transnationals against our country. And it's because if we want Colombia to become a world power of, for life, we have to stop this abuse of the transnationals that demand from the that are multimillionaire because in our territories we're saying stop stop here because we don't want you here doing these projects that are extractive and that threaten our water and our life and due to that defense from the different organizations different platforms like the committee for the defense of water in Paramo de Santurban like our our YU brothers in La Guajira, we have been the target of attacks on behalf of these multinational and attacks against important achievements. For example, in Santurban, they stopped the multinational gay star that then changed their name to Ecoro, stopped the exploitation of Santurban and contaminate our water, but also against judicial decisions that are very important, for example, uh, the one from our brothers and sisters who are you uh, in favor of the right to water, to health, and to human rights. So we're going to start telling a little bit about why this genesis or this proposal, uh, social organizations presented unamicus to the Constitutional Court but this, they realized that this couldn't just stay as a judicial discussion, but this had to go further to the civil society. It had to connect the civil society from a political decision from the state. And next to Alcajar, the Santurban Committee, in this plan form, they talk to the country and different organizations that are national and international we're asking to the for the review for the on behalf of the national government of the system and this statement had the backup of 290 organizations nationally and international and also the backup of over 60 congress people from different uh camps and after this declaration there's the international mission that visited us a few months ago here in Colombia where they were in La Guajira, they were in Santurban. There was advocacy that happened, meetings with different entities of the national government asking for the need of this review and for this review to be done 
with an uh, active participation on, and with the decision of the communities in its territories. And we launched a petition that is to organize uh, an, an audit commission that includes people from the civil society to do this review of this arbitrary system and of the investment chapter that allows them for the, the multinational corporations to uh, make us defend our water, defend our environment and tell them we don't want these extractive projects in our territory. That petition already has the backup of over, of over a thousand signatures. And that makes us very happy because what it shows us is that the people are interested in this and that this has to be a decision from the state and it has to be a decision that is connected to civil society. So after this context, we're gonna be talking first with the organizations that have the platforms, social platforms, two of these platforms who have had to withstand this abuse from the multinationals. One is from our comrades YU in La Guajira, and the other one is the Comité Santurban in Santander. So we're going to start with the question uh, uh, with the, our Wayu collaborators, because the mining Glencore, the mining company Glencore has demanded Colombia three times. And as a result of the international mission that came to visit us, we found out that they've threatened the country two other times with demands. And these demands that Glencore starts speak comes up based in the process of implementation of the sentence SU 698 of the Constitutional Court that's a conquest of the fight of our Wayu brothers in favor of the Kalawa rights, oh no, no the, the, the rights to water and to health for the community. And so I'll hand the mic over to our coworker Misael that having into consideration this context for him to talk to us about why is it important that you all ask communities that are affected for on behalf by Glencore, why you must have an active participation in the review of the system and also in the review of the chapter of investments that allow these kinds of demands, multimillionaire demands in, uh, against the country. So Misael, you have five minutes to explain to people why, well, people that are connected in Colombia and other parts of the country, why it's important for you all to have a, an active participation. Good morning. Thank you so much. Well, why we have to be there? I think that the question here is extraneous. Because we're tired of of making visible this whole problem that's happening in La Guajira and the communities, in the ethnic communities, because of all the mi mining activity in Cerrejón. This, maybe you've heard the company or the reports that are published, the company is publishing them, but they don't listen to the community. They haven't asked us what is actually happening in each of these communities, what is actually happening in La Guajira, in the Wayu territory, what is actually happening it, with the farm workers. Today, what the company is hiding and what they're never gonna say is that there's over 16 communities that are displaced because of the mining activity from Sarajón. They've been relocated on behalf of the company. What happens with that right, that right to life? What happens with the right 
to live. And within this, we need to be taken into consideration and be listened to so that we can explain what is happening here in La Guajira. What is it that Cerrejón is doing in this territory? Knowing that they're doing things wrong, knowing that they're affecting us, they continue to deny this. They continue patting their backs as a responsible company, the best mining company. Yeah, responsible, but for all of those damages that are environmental and ecological damages to our health and to our sociocultural environment for the illnesses, that's what they're responsible. That's what Gwen Corrins is responsible for. A sentence of impunity, same as what other other ones that the high courts have presented and none of them have gone through demands on behalf of children on behalf of the environment failures that have happened and nothing at all has happened so far and so aside from that today we are against them drying up another creek this would be number 19 they've destroyed 96 bodies of water Today, Glencore has the gall to come demand the state because we're not going to let them dry up the last creek that we have, the last source of the river that goes through the Department of the Department of La Guajira that feeds all the YU communities. So today, Glencore is suing the state because we won't let them exploit the kilometers in this creek that feeds these communities. So that's why today we say to the government, we've been saying it's in the caravan from the International Commission that the government needs to remove itself from these agreements that are macabre, that are in favor of the companies. Today from the territory, we can say that Glencore is a company that's cheating. There's they're cheating and bribing the state and extorting the state. If they exploit, they win. If they don't exploit, they win. And if they don't, we and we lose whether or not they exploit. So So we presented all of this and they saw it with their own eyes. They touch the reality that happens within this territory with the mining activity. So it's very concerning that the, to not talk about the subject of health today. What is the price that they get when they talk about reforestation, reparation, if they haven't done anything at all in the territory? The creeks, they're never gonna give them back, like they said, that those creeks, they said that they were going to return them, and no, that's why we're demanding today that this creek goes back to its natural flow, because these agreements aren't bringing anything good to us, and that's why we have to be at this table, that's why we have to be asked, that's why today, in the pressure that Glencore is exerting on the state, that's why we have to be heard. Because the one thing is what's happening over there, and another thing is what's happening here in the territory. And we are exerting this right of territory, defense of territory of water and life. That is right, Misael. Thank you so much, Misael, for being with us in this space and telling us about this transnational abuse in La Guajira that shows also how these demands of is also undercutting the judicial power of our country and it interferes and impedes the measures that are necessary because this the, this that is happening in La Guajira can happen throughout the whole country everybody knows uh, the whole country and how these multinationals interfere in on these these measures 
to be able to defend the ta the peoples that are being affected by these international companies in our territories. And now I'll hand the mic to coworker Saniento Lobo from the Committee for the Defense of the Water in the Paramo Santo Urban, who is going to tell us about the case of Santurban that currently three mining companies from Canada have sued Colombia but for over a thousand million dollars because of us put, putting putting up a, a, a line as we say and saying no you're not going to exploit Santurban you're not going to leave without water over two million people in Colombia and that's why because of an attitude of love for the territory, for dignity from Santander and for all Colombia, because this has been a fight for all of Colombia and they've sued us. So Juan Camilo, I'll hand you the mic so that you can tell us from this panorama if what these companies, these demands that affect the territories, why is it important what the citizenship affected by these extractive projects in Sartorban, why must one have an active participation in the review of this arbitrary system, arbitration system, and in the review of the investment chapter that allow for these demands and this international abuse. Juan Camilo, I'll hand you the mic and you have five minutes. Thank you very much, Maeri. Do you hear us? Yes, we hear you fine. First, I would like to send a warm greeting to everyone and every organization that is listening and is also accompanying these processes and have been very key in helping to defend human rights in our territories. And I would also like to especially thank the committee for their specific aid, especially a group that investigates human rights and environmental rights from the National University and others who have shown a real example of how to defend Mother Earth and the territories and the local population. So to begin to talk about this situation related to the committee, first we need to remember and go back in time when 14 years ago, many people including Rafael who's here with me and Jesus with one of the trade unions, and Mayerli, who is the moderator here, and others who began this fight to defend water and the environment 14 years ago against transnational corporations that were trying to exploit the Paramo and affect the to, would, which would affect the ecology and the water in the northeast of Colombia, affecting the Paramo and the forests that have a lot to do with climate regulation. We, through a huge mobilization, mobilization we were able to stop Glencore. However, these transnational corporations were able to take advantage of the free trade agreements to blackmail the government and organizations working in environmental protection. This has been a very complicated situation because the population has been able to gain space in, in terms of the FTAs of free trade agreements. And 
through the social movement have been able to make progress. But it's very complicated because even though they are able to protect the environment, the transnational corporations are continuing to work in the region and affect the water. And they're doing this through a corporation in the United Arab Emirates and other Canadian corporations. And so these corporations are there right now and are affecting the mountains, which is going to destroy the water source for 3 million people. And the courts have ruled in favor of the transnationals and of course, the free trade agreements play the role of international policemen to say that if you do not allow us to exploit your territory, we will sue you. And in this case, uh, these lawsuits in this case are for billions of dollars. And this is an incredibly complex situation. Currently, through the Eco Oro or Eco Gold project, they left some tunnels and wells open that are causing problems in, with the environment. And if, according to studies, there is arsenic and mercury that is coming out of these holes and contaminating the water that is drunk by people in urban areas. But it, despite all this, they are suing Colombia for over $700 million. They destroyed the water, they contaminated it, and on top of that, they're suing the government. And this is also, this is going on through the canadian Colombian free trade agreement in that framework. And so what's happening here? So through these lawsuits, they start pointing out the activists, some of the people that are here and they are accused of getting in the way of development and promoting violence. And this is because we are resisting in the territory and keeping out their exploitation. And this has caused a lot of strategies that have caused stigmatization and criminalization of these activists. And we want the Ministry of Commerce to take into account the local communities to enable their participation in the review of these systems and to also take down this system that is causing so much trouble. That is so true, Juan Camilo. Thank you very much for the words from the Committee for the Defense of the Environment in Santander, Santander. And this is the second example that is showing the level of abuse from transnational corporations, which is also leading to other situations that are endangering environmental activists in Colombia. And the Colombian government has decided to review these protection agreements and system of our arbitration that is causing us to lose sovereignty over our territories. Now we're going to talk a little about, bit about the international mission that visited Colombia that was known as Stop ISDS.
and came down to see how people were working to stop environmental degradation. People came from different countries in Latin America and Europe. Throughout the declarations, the process and the mission, Jen in the chat is putting links to our declarations. So if anybody wants to learn more about it, you can go to these documents and see all the information that we have available. Through this initiative, we're very happy to have with us organizations that are joining this large movement to promote public debate, the threat is the lawsuits from the transnationals, not just about resources, also about water and the ecosystem that are endangered by this international blackmail and is dangerous for all of us. So right now we're going to hear from our sister organizations of the Plataforma La Guajira and the Plataforma Desca from Jenny Ortiz and Aura Rodriguez. So they are going to talk about their perspective about the importance of having civil society involved in these areas with regard to the free trade um, agreements in this area and the processes announced by the national government. And if you could talk about how you're going to include civil society in this review. So Jenny Ortiz is going to talk in the name of the La Guajira platform and she'll talk about the importance of involving civil society. Thank you, my dear Lee. Hello, everybody. I'm Jenny Ortiz. I'm a CNAP researcher, which is the Center for Popular Research. We've been working as different organizations for the last 15 years, accompanying organizations affected by international organizations that are affecting our country. There are three central aspects that I'd like to talk about in the little time I have. First, the new government began to review the bilateral and international trade agreements that were signed during governments that were favorable to the business sector and left us in a situation of deep dis inequality. It is possible to have good bilateral accords, but these are not. Where Colombia has lost its sovereignty and where corporations and companies that, countries that support these corporations such as Switzerland are taking over sovereignty of our country. Within the civil society organizations, we are collaborating with civil society organizations in the other countries that are parties to these agreements. For example, Switzerland and Germany, which are actively participating. And everyone in Europe, the US and other countries are the ones that benefit off the pain and destruction in the local communities here. Now, with regard to international arbitration, Glencore is an organization that has been violating human rights since 1995 in Colombia, specifically in La Guajira. This company, which owns a large corporation in, 
in one part of the country and then later in another part of the country have been accomplices in human rights violations in a particular way. Misael was talking about what was going on years ago about violation of food sovereignty and the right to water. The courts have respected and have judged in favor of the community's rights, especially in La Guajira. But what the corporation has done is to sue the government to get access to do their mining. And so we are losing out in regard to these free trade agreements because it is the other com countries that went out with these free trade, free trade agreements. So if you analyze this, we go into the court, we lose, and the corporations, on the other hand, must respect local human rights and should not act with impunity as they have been. If Glencore agreed to respect human rights, they would pull back on their lawsuit. And the local people are also trying to defend their own sovereignty. We are a sovereign government, a sovereign country. And we are not afraid of this arbitration. Other countries such as Mexico have been involved in this. And one of the things that we are very worried about is that big capital is going to win out. And I'll let me just one more thing and then I'll be finished. I think that this final element is very important. Finally, civil society organizations applaud the efforts to participate in debate. And we want to recognize civil society, civil society organizations, the reports that they've made that talk about the or communities that have been victim of these different corporations. And we want this audit, auditing process to be more in solidarity with local people and not just related to payment and compensation, but we also want there to be criminal consequences if they have been found to violate people's human rights. And we want this to be something that will be binding and not voluntary. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you for being with us in this space. And now I will hand the mic to Rod Aura Rodriguez, Technical Secretary for the Platform Tesca, to also give us some ideas and perspective on why it's important to participate uh, and but an active participation in the review of these treaties to the defense of investment and in this arbitration system. So go ahead, Aura, you have five minutes. Thank you so much, Nayeli, and thank you for the invitation. First, to say that the Plataforma uh, for about 25 years, we've been going over the subject of the commercial treaties and their relation to human rights. And from there, we had the possibility of pressuring for the participation of civil society in the treaty between Colombia and the United States and the agreement with the EU. And from there, some reflections that we've done around this subject and also from others I think it was important to share some ideas, especially because of why we have to uh, ask for the participation. Uh, first of all, we have to change the con the concept, with the relationship between state and society and the place of the companies. The states can negotiate beyond the citizenship, simply the ways that are affecting us and that have to do with our rights. Jenny has said it, but also from the platform and many organizations, we don't, not only in Colombia, but in the world, 
we have to, they have commented in cases as Latin America and there is a narrow relationship between the advances of treaties and the participations of these big, big multinational companies and the violation of human rights rights and the relation of how the armed conflict has gone up in countries such as ours. Many years ago, we documented not just specific cases and territories, but also how it's a permanent element, for example, the fact that the displacement forced in territories and big multinational projects, the violations of of worker rights and territories in a massive way uh, towards the towards women also. And this makes a society not just the one that receives the negative effects of these agreements, but that we also have mechanisms that are real and effective where we can be part of the negotiations and other mechanisms because of pressure and demands from the organizations. We have had different spaces, but who takes the decisions are of course the states on their own. But when we want to say the states, the estates with the voice of the companies that participate as a civil society in this type of negotiation, and uh, of course, as far as negotiations today, we think that the participation has to be effective because of different things. First, because we have to look and face the, the will of the national government of reviewing these treaties, but it is needed that the civil society has a voice that's real in this kind of review and this kind of mechanism. It can't just be something about access or isolated by moments, there have to be mechanism that makes this be effective. In a lot of ways, it has been known as the the room on the side going around the functionaries and the government. What is needed is transparent mechanism that are open and form the civil society so that it can be clear how this relationship amongst the violation of human rights and this advancement in general or these models for commerce. The third is has to do with there exists from the proposed organizations about how to build a commercial relationship that's different. And there's also been reflections globally and from Colombia about how these figures of treaties and all of these mechanisms that allow the companies to be above even the international treaties for human rights, and that has to be reevaluated, and the model of development have to be under discussion, and that has to be part of what we're talking about. It's not just a problem of a ne any mechanism in which the companies uh, demand, they take resources from the state, but they have to actually question and review this model of development because when the human rights are under doubt in Colombia, for example, the dis development of peace and even democratic paths to take decisions that can't be above us. But there's a fourth component and that's the last, and it has to do with what we're talking about with public resources, that is to say, in the case of these big companies, then they demand and they win the demands against these the states. There are resources, our commonwealth, national wealth, that are that are in play, and it affects us. Not just it's 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 all of our pockets in this case, Colombians. And there's other things, but I'll I'll share it in another moment. Thank you so much, Aura, for sharing the space and for those reflections. And we've talked about the importance of social participation in the review of these treaties of protection to investment, the system of arbitration that allows for this transnational abuse in our territories. But now we're going to go in to some more, some more concrete 
we are presenting to the national government a proposal that is concrete and that we hope is being taken into consideration, a proposal that's being made from the Committee of the Defense of the Water in Paramo de Santurban, from the Plataforma La Guajira Speaks to the Country, our brothers and sisters from La Guajira, for the Guayu community, and the effort of different organizations national and international that are the ones that are with us. We are generating this proposal for this auditory commission from the civil society in Colombia in this revision. And we've talked about the importance of the civil society. We're gonna be talk talking about this in this conversation about how this proposal is being made, how we can have this proposal. And I am happy to invite to the space Javier Echaide, who is a lawyer in Buenos Aires, specializing in international rights to investment and international rights. He was also vice president of the Commission of Auditoria of uh, audits and the system of arbitration in Ecuador. And it came from the from denouncing treaties in Ecuador in 2017. So uh, Javier, as I said, we've talked about the importance of connecting civil society in an active participation. And how it could be added in this audit, how, what does it entail, how we can do it, what is the possible route that we could implement, and what are the, what's the timeline, because that is also important to keep into consideration if we want this government to have the change to be a, a world power and we can realize this dream. Welcome, and you have 10 minutes. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation, and thank you for giving the opportunity to be able to, to do this concrete proposal because it's, it would be, it's good to take advantage of these experiences that happen in Latin America and the system of protection of investment that affects the entire region especially in Colombia recently, but all the countries in Latin America. I'm just speaking to you from Buenos Aires. I am Argentinian, I'm not Colombian, but I was part of the Auditory Commission independently that, was in, that happened in Ecuador a few years ago. And the idea is to show you a little bit about what this proposal was about. So we're going to try to share the screen. Let's see. Let me know if you can see it. I think so. Great. Great. As I said, a few years ago, there was a commission that was confirmed independently about the treaties of in investment and arbitrary system. This happened on behalf of the Equatorian government. The idea was to realize, uh, to do an audit in, in an ample sense that you're a judicial audit, accounting audit that could take into account, account the consideration of the impact in investment. This commission was known as the CAITISA, and I was the vice president of this commission. Dr. Car Carlos Gaviria, who's Colombian, 
uh, who passed away a few years ago, was the first president of that commission. And Cecilio Olivet uh, from Uruguay was the second president. And she's the one that turned in the final report to President Correa. The confirmation of that commission, auditory commission, was independent. You can see the commissioners here, who those of us who were members of the commission, the ones who are in blue, were part of the gov are members of the government in Ecuador. Uh, there was four ministries that were the ministries that were affected by the de multinationals. Um, demands. This has affected the different areas of the government. And so it was called the Great Ciceria, the, the uh, foreign relations, the planning and development uh, for different ministries that has that Ecuador has. Also, uh, the secretary, ju uh, judicial secretary for the presidency, and a fourth minister, that's, and there's the pol politi politics minister that was also affected as part of this commission. And then the rest of the commissioners, it was all of us commissioners that were independent. As you can see, the majority of the members of the commission, we all came whether from civil society or, or specializations. We were commissioners specializing in and um, mostly countries that were foreign to Ecuador. Just the commissioners that were independent, only one was from Ecuador, uh, Pia de Mancero. The rest of us are, were foreigners, including Son Araja from Malaysia. But then the rest, we all were from Latin America. And there was a mixture or several disciplines. It wasn't just lawyers. It was also uh, economists, experts in international relationships, et cetera, in different areas of social sciences. We were doing studies as far as how treaties for protection of investments and the uh, arbitration demands against, in this case, Ecuador, how they were affecting the interests, the rights, and the policies of the Ecuadorian state, as was mentioned before. All these demands had to be paid by the public funds from the state. And those funds that are made up of the taxes from citizens. citizens. And in that sense, that's the public interest of all the people that live in the territory that's being sued. This is a structure, a uh, map, let's say, uh, that's simplified of what Kaitisa had so that you can observe here. We had, at the moment of forming the commission, we had the possibility, obviously, of naming our own authorities we all unanimously naming Dr. Gaviria as a president, but also an important part was to be able to make up our own methodology of investigation. That is to say how to do uh, the audit. In that sense, it was key to be able to establish those parameters to be able to investigate. We divided the methodology of investigation of commission in three sections. One that had to do with the treaties themselves, the investment treaties themselves, it was an area that was that I was in charge of. The second axis was the demands, everything that had to do with uh, how the com multinational companies, transnational companies were suing the Equatorian estates. For example, the CIADI, who's the which is the most used on an international level, but it's not the only one. And that's there was an investigation there as far as other demands and possible threats of demands. And finally, the area of economic impact to try to verify concretely if really this system of protection of investments can really attract 
for an investment if that happens. If it doesn't happen, if it doesn't get proved, proven, and if there has been a, a denounce of the treaties, of the elimination of these types of treaties, and how has this impacted? We had a support on behalf of uh, an executive secretary who was from Ecuador and who stayed in Quito throughout the commission's work. The commission was going to last for a year with another potential year. And at the end, it lasted two years that that what had been planned. We did a final report that was submitted to the president and I'll talk about the results now. Here, if you read all the agreements signed by Ecuador, most of them offer corporations different kinds of arbitration in regards to their suits or demands. And so there is a diversity of offers, but only two have been used, the CIADI and the UNC trial rules, which are international arbitration rules. And these are the only two that have been used. And these UNSA trial rules have to do with an international tribunal which are also within CIADA. So these are two different kinds of tribunals that are used by the World Bank, where corporations can file lawsuits based on supposed violations of rules in the free trade agreements. Here are the effects of the lawsuits in CIADA by, for Ecuador that is from the Ecuador's Attorney General. This was not part, it was not part of our audit to talk about defense mechanisms to find out whether there had been good or bad defense, but rather to see how Ecuador had been affected by its own institutional mechanisms. And not talk about poor defense. The problem is not who is defending the state, but rather who is setting the rules for these mechanisms, because these investor state dispute settlement mechanisms favor the transnationals. So there is a huge probability of losing, for a country to lose under international arbitration following the rules of the game in these agreements. And the system that is designed to put public policy in the witness stand by uh, taking advantage of international capital because national capital is at a disadvantage in terms of the use of these mechanisms. What we observed finally was that most of the agreements in the case of Ecuador did not go through review by the Congress before they were adopted. They were just adopted as is by the government in power at the time without any kind of oversight by the country through either a vote or the Congress, et cetera. Another thing that was very important and which surprised us is that we found evidence that most international corporations come from countries with which Ecuador does not have a trade agreement. So there was no attraction 
which is one of the by for Ecuador, which is one of the reasons why these agreements are entered into. And it, this is an old argument from the 1990s, because they say if you sign these agreements, investment will come. But this has showed us empirically in the field that Ecuador was one of these cases where signing agreements did not bring the kind of investment that was desired. And that these agreements and the arbitration that is part of them is decisive in terms of what of these lawsuits, which have a chilling effect on expanding rights and can bring about transformation in public policy and regulations that affect funding and can end up causing huge problems for the country because they are overwhelmed by lawsuits that are favorable to the investors. Finally, we recommended to Ecuador in our report, which was a non-binding report for the president, is that we denounced by leaving all of these agreements that Ecuador had signed and starting over with new rules of the game to give the government of Ecuador better opportunities to exercise their sovereign, sovereignty with more benefits for the population and public support and engagement is very important to these processes. And based on the audit and the recommendations Ecuador did denounce the free trade agreements. And they didn't do it in a heavy handed way. And the risk that there was, which ended up not happening, is that they that international investment would pull out of Ecuador. What international investment wants to do is to make a profit by following the rules of the game but not thinking that their investment is going to fail to then have to go to the courts and to international arbitration, which might rule in their favor. But this is simple for international investors or any kind of investors. They prefer not to go to arbitration, but if they have to, they will. And we feel that it's important to have these kinds of independent auditing to be able to open up what's going on and see what's happening and make sure that everybody can participate and to be able to defend everybody's interests. Thank you so much, Javier, for telling us about this experience that you participated in. Ecuador's experience with review of the investment protection mechanisms. And it's important to highlight that this did not chase away international investment by challenging these extractive projects, which was questioned because it is a danger to the local ecosystem and environment and the water and the local population, et cetera. Right now, we'd like to welcome Maria Paula Arenas Quijana, who is the director of Foreign Investment and Services of the Ministry of Commerce in Colombia. I would like to thank Maria Paula for agreeing to come 
talk to the local and international organizations that are here and talk to them who, as you can see, have broad experience in this review of the investor state dispute settlement mechanisms. And they are making proposals. And Colombia's government is supporting this. They have already released their agreement with regard to these ISDSs. So Maria Paula, welcome. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us. We would like you to explain what this review of these international investment agreements involves, which has been or is being done publicly by the Ministry of Commerce. And if you could explain, and then we would like to ask our panelists to respond to this proposal as part of civil society with regard to auditing these agreements. Welcome, Maria Paula. The mic is yours. Hello, everybody. I'd like to ask if you can hear me well. And if not, I can um, adjust things. Oh, we hear you very well. My Jelly and everybody else who is in this meeting, thank you for to the speakers and everybody who has come. I think that it's clear that that we are taking into account everybody's suggestions. We had a public hearing in May, which was very important to us. So we want to take into account everybody's opinion before moving ahead. I don't want to repeat what's already been said because I think you already know that all countries are reviewing these agreements, there are some 6,000 of them around the world. But that doesn't mean that we don't have to make the changes that we need to make. Colombia has been watching carefully what's been going on internationally with regard to free trade agreements looking towards the future and to see what is needed to have or review investment agreements that already exist or to have new ones. And what we have seen is that not just Colombia is talking about that, this. So, to get down to specifics, what do we think that a good investment agreement do for Colombia at this time? The first thing is that we, we are investment chapters that are part of the free trade agreements, and then there are also bilateral investment agreements or treaties, and you can read them. And these, some of these agreements are very old. And we need to review them. For example, we have one with Switzerland that needs to be reviewed. And we've done a timeline of the agreements to see which ones are most in need of review. And in practice, will, this will lead us to what countries are calling a model agreement. 
and we informed the Congress about what we're thinking of doing and have done and how are we going to define the next steps and what this model agreement should look like. And I want to say that we have spoken with the minister about the initiatives that you have so well put forward. And we would like to have a meeting with the participants and the minister and the people who are have been involved in looking at these free trade agreements. What I'd like to talk about today is what, what will it mean for Colombia to have a modernized free trade agreement? And as a preamble, we're looking at Colombia's place or situation in a globalized world. And currently, the there is a lot going on internationally that is illicit that is affecting Colombia. Through measures that sometimes are legitimate that have the need to protect legitimate interests like the environment. Often it doesn't ha it also happens that the states stop regulating and taking measures because of this, and we don't want to fall into that either. So for us, it's important to do this movement and what did we have to keep in mind to do this adjustment? What should be a modernization or an investment agreement? You know that the Constitutional Court had two sentences uh, as far as the need of adjustment through the recommendation of the court and those adjustments were made on the investment standards, standards that today have been discussed a lot and their discussion is to do their ambiguity that, that exists when interpreting them by international tribunals of investment. That was taking into account uh, in order to review what that standard should include. And today in the practice is how to limit those standards to have this equilibrium between what happened in the state and the protection of the investment. That can also be reviewed in all the forums. You know, there's a forum about procedure of investment controversies where we can that there's discussion and not just the standards of investment as a procedure, but also the rules of the investing investment state. And also, and this is a pol political subject and the type of investment that Colombia wants to have the investment that we want. And it's an investment that we want to come into a transition in our energy matrix, an investment that generates for all our population that has a transference that's technological and that has results in all the territories and for all the people that are gonna be a part of that investment work and of our nationals. So that's an investment that this winnings generate and these learning or these lessons. So this proposal for investment agreement had four important points. This is an, in the area of application, what Colombia believes is that it has to be very clear what comes in and what doesn't come in, especially in environment subjects. We have to do an exclusion of these sectors that don't form part of a protection of this type of agreement, like water resources and jungles. That has to be clear. 
a supremacy of the right to regulate. The states are sovereign. And they have not just the right, but the obligation. So that has to be really clear. The third point is the limitation of the adjustment of the clauses that we've been talking about, a treatment that's just and equitable, a nation that is favored and a protection and security. All of this has to be looked over. Uh, experience has shown us how these standards have been interpreted and often states don't know because they don't they're not thinking about it but often and it hasn't been a an interpretation that we can say oh this is in agreement with the interest of the parts that are being negotiated often it's because two states are the ones that negotiate and you say, oh, well, this tribunal didn't have into consideration what the states agreed to. So those standards have to be reviewed and if needed to be eliminated. What we've seen is that you can show the way and the possibility to eliminate certain standards in this moment and it will get done. It's important anyway to have the limitation of the standards clauses that take one to that limitation and that keep it really clear in the moment that it's like any controversies that you can't go beyond an interpretation because it'll be clear how far you can go. And finally, the fourth pillar is what goes, is reviewed. There's a solution of investments. And it's a, it's a very shortened version where it's, uh, the, the possibility is much more limited for access to jurisdictions and the uh, and for the tribunals to get to know these cases, as you can tell in the, what I just said, when you take what's substantial or you limit what's substantial for the court, that is that Colombia protects investors and protects this kind of investment that is that we were talking about. But where there's a clarity in the reach and the interpretation of these standards, and it's way less feasible to get demands that are superfluous or that are subject to interpretation. So this is broadly what we want to put in practice in as far as environment, what we've written up as far as the model And we have the four to five clauses in the supremacy of human rights, the right to the environment as a human right, and to see how you can limit these standards and for that to be in accordance with what we want to avoid. So this is very broadly, but I thought it was important to come tell you we have to do like a conducing thread of what has happened a little bit more landed and what is happening in other countries, what type of clauses. Once again, Colombia, we're not talking by ourselves. So we're aware of that. And we've talked about having an in-person meeting with you all. And thank you for being here. Thank you for the space. And we'll always be really happy to be able to share with you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Paula, for being in the space and for telling us about what the reach is going to be or how you're thinking about it from the commerce, from the Office of Commerce as far as these treaties, and we also celebrate that from the 
to, to have a meeting in person, to plan a meeting with us in person. And uh, we will look to see how we can create that space. And so after these reflections that the organizations had, national and international, I want to call the two platforms for civil society that are with us in this space and that reflect the transnational abuse for the territories and how this threatens our sovereignty, how this threatens our water, our ecosystems, our health, our human rights. And, and to the environmental advocates, and also Juan Camilo, who's with Angel. Uh, if, if I may call him Angelito, that's what we call him with lots of love because of what he represents uh, for this struggle. And I also call Misael from our brothers and sisters, uh, from uh, men and women who are YU, to give us some reflections about what you've heard, what you just heard and the the Secretary of Commerce of Camilo Angelito, you have five minutes. Thank you so much, Mayeli. And firstly, I wanna thank the organizations of the mission, Aura Jenny and Misael of this such a representative struggle there in the territory we have we're looking with very very, very positive lights and as far as participation and the secretary of commerce that to create this dialogue and the dialogue what it represents is a change there's a real change that change we can see are represented in that dialogue that's been constant there's always uh, room for that dialogue. And we have to recognize that there is a change there. What we need is for that change to be enough, enough to eliminate the violence in the territories, the risk and the damage against the water in Santurban and Nor Oriente, in the nor Northwest, Colombian Northwest and for all the Colombians who are from Santurban and all this ecosystem and that is so essential to life. So we need for that change to be enough. And that implies eliminating the system, taking that system out, because as a lot of people have said, it's a myth that that system brings investments. It doesn't do this. What it does bring is damage in as far as water and health. So we need for that change to be enough to eliminate all these violences. And very concretely, we ask to put your eyes on the treaty, free trade agreement with Canada too, because that's been pushed aside. And from that, that relationship with Canada that are purely extractivists, there's been a great vulnerability from the territory, great, of vulnerability of the of Colombian people and we have to change those relationships that exist with Canada and the government has to look towards here and generate some deep transformations that are real and that eliminate these violences because it's not an exclusively financial subject but I will hand the mic over to Angelito who is also going to share their perspective. Thank you. Thank you to the international people for this help, this interest in helping Colombia, helping this Colombian people. And thank you to the nationals of uh, national platforms and from our people from La Guajira. I see uh, Ingrid Light, also what we just heard from the Secretary of Commerce. 
I think that's very important because we are concerned about what's happening with these treaties and these international treaties because they come to exploit us is what we see and they threaten us and they contaminate us. What is happening with this in invasion and this international invasion of Colombia is that it's against life. It's against life, not just human life, but life in general, natural life, nature in our territories. At least what is happening here in our territory in Paramo de Santurban is where we're in the highest part in the Paramo. And from then down, we have our community aqueducts that take water to over 2 million people. But even further down, there are also other aqueducts and other communities that benefit from the Cuenca that these Paramos form from the... Uh, there's some fishermen and there's a there's a community in the high part, which is the Paramo, and then the watershed, which is the lower area, which is Santurban, and then the River Magdalena. But then it keeps going, the contamination, the pollution, and the damage that's being done through the Magdalena River towards the Caribbean Ocean. And there, all this whole di biodiversity that we have, they're contaminating us from the top to the all the way down and it goes against life. All our living beings that are there, not just humans, I repeat. And also. And then with regard to threats also, this is an inv invasion against l l human life and biodiversity by transnational corporations polluting the land and the water. And then with this new government, we hope that they can achieve a change with this problem. And as the delegate from the ministry announced, we hope to reach agreements that we can then, will then serve to get free of these agreement. And we'd like to thank everybody who is helping us to save our lives and our territory. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Camilo. And thank you, Angelito, for your thoughts. From the Plataforma Santo Urban and the Committee for the Defense of Water. And what you've done to defend the Paramo in Santurban. And all your work has served to help save the ecosystem and the water for the local people. Now I'm going to turn it over to Misael from Fuerza de Mujeres YU. Please. I also want to just mention that we are going to choose two questions from the chat or the Q&A. And then each of the two questions will be given to our panelists who will have three minutes each to answer. So right now I'd like to give Misael the mic who works with Fuerza de Mujeres YU and has been working alongside us throughout the entire process. Thank you, I'm still on the road. <laughs> and I wanna thank Jenny and Angelito from La Guajira. I've been listening also to what the delegate from the ministry just said. We have one concern. Hang on a sec. Oh, it was our concern, based on what we have been listening to here. That we are crossing our fingers, hoping that this is going to 
come true with regard to the agreement with Switzerland. All of us who have been involved in the process and who are fighting for our territories, people from the communities, this is an agreement that can be analyzed with regard to our own environment. We have to look at who is benefiting from these agreements. And what effects are they going to have on the territory? For example, we are pleased that there will be a review of the agreement. This does help to reassure us a bit, a bit but it is still something that is on a desk. It still needs to be sent to the territories and the communities need to be consulted. The speaker's uh, connection is weak and is cutting out. Those of us who are affected by the agreements. Those of us who are active in the local regions. We hope that these things can happen and that this review will have an effect on the agreement and that it can help to lift this great weight off of our local regions that we have been suffering under and that it stops harming what we do have. And we do have to wait to see what happens. Hopefully this will take place and it will have a positive effect in rather than just saying, oh, for these reasons, it can't happen. We want it to be a true change. With regard to the dialogue that Juan Camilo mentioned between the government, the civil society organizations and the local population. That needs to happen too, thank you. Thank you, Misael. Javier? Or Jenny? Would you like to give us some three minute response? You can go ahead. So shall I go? Yes, please. I insist that public participation is clear is key because Colombians in each region are the ones who are affected. We also see, and the delegate from the ministry mentioned this, that this is not just something happening in Colombia. And Latin America is one of the most affected regions with regard to free trade agreements. And what we're seeing is that, that there is a closer and more direct connections between multinationals and natural resources, which can lead to social conflict. There is not a lot of literature internationally about the intersections between civil unrest and the effects of these free trade agreements. However, there has been a lot of exper experience in the regions themselves, the people know. So internationally in academia, among experts, et cetera, who 
are following this, we want to know, we want to learn about what the local experiences are because there's a lot to be learned there. And we can also support the struggles by local people in these regions by providing advice uh, with regard to other cases that have been brought forward internationally. So those of us who have been lucky enough to participate in the international mission to Colombia were able to learn from all of you about how you are suffering the consequences in local regions. So we take back these cases and analyze them to provide solidarity to your struggles and also to open our eyes even more to the threats that this system involves. And this is part of international debate. Colombia is not alone. It can be a leader with regard to a review of this entire area and agenda and the effects on local people and regions inside countries. And so we would like to offer our help to any local organization that would like to have it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier. Here we have a question for Maria Paula, who is the Director of Investment and Foreign Investment and Services of the Ministry of Trade. The coming year will be the 10th anniversary of the agreement between the United Kingdom and Colombia. After 10 years, it's possibly in to jointly to agree to change in the agreements. For example, remove the CIADA system. Is this information in the working agenda for all of you in the Ministry of Trade, Maria Paula? Maria Paula, would you be able to respond to this question that's in the chat? You have three minutes. I'll be brief. Yes, we are reviewing as we're able to see how we can improve the dispute settlement mechanisms. And the United Kingdom is one of the agreements that we will be reviewing. And I think the issue with regards to the CIADI system is on the table. Because this is not the most beneficial forum for a government. And so we need to know exactly what it means, which parts of the system protect investors and investment um, and other technical things having to do with frivolous suits. And so we do hope and we think that this will be fruitful with this, uh, that this review will be fruitful. Thank you. Thank you. Maria Paula. And now we are going to start winding up. We have a few more minutes before the top of the hour, and we would like to use them to give a chance to two of our colleagues to give us some conclusions and next steps in this process. First, we're going to hear from Alejandro, who is a professor at the 
national universities of a political an analyst. He's been studying and analyzing these policies for years. Welcome, Alejandro. Could you please give us the first conclusions from this webinar? You have five minutes. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. More than conclusions, I would like to propose several reflections with regard to steps to be taken. I'd like to start by saying this is a very difficult debate. It is very demanding, which is a play on words in Spanish related to lawsuits. So talking about demands or lawsuits against sovereign states has to do with the core of the redesign of institutions since the 1980s. It is not an accident. It is not a lateral issue. Rather, it expresses what we could call the center of the debate with regard to what institutions we have and what institutions we need. That's first. Uh, an important debate for the institutions to guarantee human rights and to respond to the civilization crisis that we're facing as humanity today. Because of the previous, I think it's important to insist that the steps to follow, more than sequential, they're simultaneous and they should be in multiple spaces. First of all, I think it's fundamental, the exercise that we're doing about getting alliances. And I think the gaining the alliances has to be seen in a multi-scale level. We have to reinforce alliances in the territories, local territories, in the national territories, and in the transnational scale. I think that that's point number one. I think, let's think about alliances that are multi-scale. The example of the committee in Santa Urban can has shown a great capacity that the movement in Santander to generate alliances to in that region of the country, but it's also had a capacity to generate alliances with other similar movements. A good example is what's happening, for example, with the defense and the territory in the territory of La Guajira. So we find dynamics there that are at a regional scale or inter-regional scale that then project nationally and they generate uh, national international alliances. That's how alliances work because we have to generate new practices of conjoined work to, and I insist, to act in several levels. The third thing that I wanna propose is this this is an academic debate and Juan Camilo said it well we need a debate here about what are the values that are important whether investments are more important or human rights are more important or if as the minister representative was saying we can think about investments according to human rights but if there's a tension dynamic and if it can be complemented, of course, we would have to look this up because so far investments have been above rights and above the life in the communities. And it's a crucial debate. What are the main values to defend? And what are the standards that are most important? If we're going to generate uh, an institutional that that values more the investments or the standard of behavior of public policy. So thirdly, I insist it's clear to hear these academic debates for, for standards and values for a democratic society. Uh, and Fourth place, I think it's important in the alliances to 
ask ourselves, what is the role of the sovereignty? Because what we have seen from the 80s here is the reinforcement of sovereignty of the capital and but more o over the transnational sovereignty and autonomy and it even creates the uh, even including the indigenous peoples that have constitutional guarantees that protect them so this is also what what is what determines this and to finish up we need a debate about the institutionality that we have and the institutionality that we need and in that mark, the institutionality implies a question, what is the regulations interstate and within states? That's a debate that has to do with the free trade agreements and investment agreements, but it's also a debate about the guarantees that states provide in front of foreign investments. And that is why I insist that we need alliances at several scales and we also need alliances in several levels because the debate of institutionality has goes through the institutions of the state, the treaties of the state, and how it can be regulated. And however, this is my last message. It, it gets moved. It moves. It moves because throughout the planet, there's a series of initiatives that are trying to destroy that power in the capital and I, while defending the territories of human rights. And that gets moved. And today we have a different reality with a different government, with other, other possibilities of public policy and also with the possibility of having victories short term. But it's important to keep in mind that that only will get decided at the medium and long term. But as Paynes was saying, uh, the long term, we'll all be dead. So the question with climate crisis is long term. Humanity wants to survive this crisis that this transnational capital has taken us to. Thank you for the effort. Thank you for listening. And big hugs because we've learned a lot. Thank you, Alejandro, for those conclusions and those steps to follow of what is coming and I heard my compañera Cindy Forero is one of the organizations uh, CAJAR which is one of the organizations we've been working with the, all these initiatives and this process to be able to review these uh, agreements of protection of investments and this and with this transnational abuse of our territory so go ahead Cindy you have five minutes Hi, Magyarli. Thank you so much for the space. Hi, I'm a lawyer for the Cooperative of Abogados and this organization that's non-governmental -gov that promotes human rights. Thank you for the space. And we want to uh, leave a few conclusions, but also some respectful petitions from the ministries that are here today. And this has to do with the petition that the communities have made to be able to participate in that review of the investment agreements, of free trade agreements that has been mentioned by the ministry. That is to say, not only to ask them to a meeting, but for that review to be able to be a, a an important review that gathers the communities and that can be both for the investment agreement and also the clauses for the free trade agreement that get the mechanism and the solution for the state. And this was something that was mentioned in the declaration and the audit, audit that was made and what has been done with the minister, different ministries. One of the asks from the communities has been to not, and it's not just a subject of revision, but to, to also denounce this system and they've also asked to do the recommendations of the UN to rescind all the international agreements of investment. And in that way, what the communities have referred to is that the sovereignty of the state is under risk and the indep judicial independence is under risk. One of the ways to protect the state and sovereignty is to eliminate that mechanism with the end 
and to be able to have defense of human rights and collective rights and the rights to environmental defense. It's also been proposed to the ministries and to the government that it's not necessary to defend and that one of the solutions would be to promote justice and the use of national justice to the resolution of these disputes between investments and state. And it could be a viable solution to not be tied to answer to an international arbitration that in the case of the Columbia State gets condemned. One of the petitions that have been made and that we should review as far as the review of these agreements is that to what point does the ministry want to contemplate not subscribe to treaties that have these clauses to protect the investments? Another thing that's important to remember is that the Colombian state should enter in a moratorium before going, before signing more international agreements for investments, and that those efforts from the uh, from the state has to center to create mechanisms to. Uh, for accountability of the violation of human rights and for the collective rights. One of the things that was said in the report that was done for the, is that the Colombians are alone in this review process, that they have a lot, if they're not alone, they have a lot of alliances in other countries and that can help. And these governments have stopped the privileges of in foreign investors and have finished uh, or ended treaties. Countries like South Africa, India, Pakistan, Indonesia, Ecuador, and Bolivia, aside from the removal of the treaty between Canada and the US, and, re and they renegotiated the free trade agreement, known as Kuzma or Technic. So renegotiating the agreements that exist, it is possible, but it's also leaving the mechanism as possible and having the experience of the process of the Caitiza and what Javier Chávez explained to us but also these other countries, that's not just one, but a ton of countries that have said we can't allow for this system to go over sovereignty, go over the judicial independence, and beyond that, in the moment of having decisions of the human rights, we are faced with international demands that not only touch communities, but also touch all Colombians because they're taking out of our pocket, they're taking our resources from the state that could be destined for the great reforms to pay for an arbitration that's international, that's just. So one of the bets that are being proposed, it's a bet from the, or, or a proposal from the communities is to take into consideration in this review and this thing that is being proposed gets to the hands of the Minister of Commerce, get to the hand of that ministry and to have all the support to move on from these unfair demands that are stopping to take decisions and benefit in the protection of human rights collectively and uh, environmental. Thank you so much for the space. And that is all. Thank you, Cindy, for these remarks that are so important and so relevant. Uh, as far as time, we have to start closing. And there's a few questions that uh, I think are important that were made in the chat, but we're not going to answer them now, but we will take them into consideration in all the spaces that we will have with the national government, the meeting that in this space uh, that the delegates from the ministry mentioned with the Secretary of Commerce, and in the other spaces that we're going to be having. We will keep these in mind. Thank you all from Colombia and other countries that were connected in this space. We really are encouraged and we see this proposal and I think that the big conclusion in this space is that we definitely the review of these treaties and these agreements to protection protecting investment to be in this international arbitration has to go through the participation active and with the power of decision from the communities of the social processes 
that are in the territories, in the Colombian territory, resisting this transnational abuse that have lived in their own bodies, what it is for these multinational corporations to come to the territories to start imposing these extractive projects that leave us without water, that destroy our strategic ecosystems. This abuse has to stop because we need Colombia to become a, a world power to protect ecosystems, protect life. And like they said here, first human rights to so the guarantee of human rights first and the protection of water beyond these interests, transnational interests. We celebrate that on behalf of the government and the Ministry of Commerce that they announced that they want to meet with us to treat these subjects. The subject, we are going to propose this that comes from an, the organization, that comes from the social organizations to do a different auditory system to different sectors of social organizations, academy, and other different spaces that represent civil society so that for this review and... I'll finish with what my compañera Cindy, for my coworker Cindy said, it is possible, it is possible to leave, to get out of this system of arbitration. It is possible to this do this revision of the treaties and it is possible to put the defense of water above and the ecosystems and life to put those first in the popul Colombian population. So thank you so much for being in this space, the people that registered and you will you will get the links on the via email, whoever wasn't able to to you'll you'll get all the links through the the you'll get the recording of this space. We ask the people that haven't signed the petition to to that we can do the national to please help us create this auditory commission to sign this petition to back up the defense of water, defense of life, def life, defense of sovereignty of this country. And we invite you to follow us with the hashtag Frenemos la Demanda de Transnacionales, to follow us on social media, the Camite Santa Urban, La Guajira, Le Habla al País, Fuerza de Mujeres, Guayú, these platforms that are defending water for all of us. Thank you all for the space and we will see each other in future initiatives.